talked about assumptions or the end of the assumptions uh, in the last class and talked about uh, proximity that well how uh, in spatial and relational terms that uh, the event becomes uh, immaterial. The other uh, aspect uh, we need to talk uh, about a little bit which said that well, uh, the actions of others assumed or actual uh, similarly placed ought not to make a difference to one's actions. So, what it is uh, simply is saying that well, how others react to a situation, how others uh, react to a, a moral requirement will uh, influence or determines how one agent's reaction to it. Now, this is uh, crucial or this is the basis of the next or the, the same claim that he makes that well, numbers lessen obligation. So, now for a famine in Bangladesh, there are numerous countries that can uh, pitch in to make a difference. So, because uh, the moral responsibility is perhaps divided into the number of uh, agents and countries. So, it, it lessens the obligations on an individual country or an individual uh, citizen. And uh, the question uh, comes forth that well, why should I give more than any else, anyone else in my situation. Uh, as in the described situation, there are a large number of agents who could act to make a difference, but this possibility reduces the moral uh, or this possibility reduces the moral onus on each agent. So, numbers lessen obligation. Now, uh, what are we thinking about this that we started talking about it that well of and, and this example in the article that uh, is given that well a drowning uh, uh, child. Now, if you are the only one uh, walking across the drowning child perhaps you are uh, obliged or to morally required to go and rescue the child, but if there are many people around that lessens your obligation. Now, uh, Singer's claim is that well, uh, first he says that if everyone in uh, my situation makes a contribution of some currency units, the crisis is solved. So, I should contribute this much and uh, the premise is in the form of a hypothesis, whereas the conclusion is given as a factual status. So, uh, clearly Singer is not in favor of the theory that numbers lessen obligation, but it is a matter of common practice that well. Uh, numbers do lessen obligation, where uh, responsibility is pinned down on an individual or at in a, in a limited agency, then the obligation is stronger. But when it is put outward, so when we uh, we have a random call for volunteers all across an uh, organization, the require uh, the moral obligation for anyone to come up is much lesser. Whereas if we have a pinpointed call for volunteers from a particular section of the organization, perhaps the uh, reaction is much stronger. This is the common. So, uh, Singer is in a way uh, doing what uh, philosophers in the conventional sense are supposed to do, revise the current standards. So, the current practices and standards are that well, numbers do lessen obligation and uh, uh, Singer is of the opinion that no, numbers do not lessen and should not, need not lessen obligation. So, if, if and, and the fallacy that he points out is that well, the premise is in the form of an hypothesis, whereas the conclusion give is gives a, a factual claim. So, the premise is that well, if there are 20 people to uh, help out this uh, or there are uh, 100 nations to help out uh, Bangladesh and each one contributes say a fixed amount of uh, resources, it should be done and therefore, uh, as in, in one of those uh, 100 nations, uh, uh, we are uh, obliged to pay only that much. But then well, what he uh, uh, points out as uh, that uh, the premise is all in the form of a hypothesis that if everyone contributes and therefore, I should contribute this much. So, that is the fallacy he points out. Uh, the utilitarian reading is that if everyone does what he ought to do, the result uh, will not be as good as it would be if everyone did a little less than he ought to do or if only some do all that they ought to do. Excess sacrifice would be a waste, unnecessary suffering caused including deficiency caused at the donor's end. So, uh, one common claim has been that well, uh, if each one of us is such a, a, a passionate fanatic contributor or uh, takes this moral responsibility so seriously, uh, it would perhaps lead to a generation of ex uh, excessive resources for the affected. And that would uh, again uh, slow down, that would uh, uh, cause uh, in the utilitarian moral calculus, it would cause a uh, deficiency in the donor uh, itself. So, if everybody is uh, passionate enough. Now, the way the world uh, works, uh, what uh, Singer points out is that well, uh, there are very few people or few agencies which are so uh, passionate and uh, it is rarely that resources are generated uh, exceeding the uh, requirements. 
But then uh, we have some of uh, examples even in the world today, where we find that well, a properly known uh, calamity has many times attracted much more resources than what is required for its resolution. There have been cases like this, and then there leads to be an accumulation of excess resources, which comes at the cost of excessive sacrifice at the, uh, at the end of the donors, and almost a distribution problem, or at the end of the, uh, at the point of the calamity. So, what uh, the critique of uh, Singer, um, Singer addresses his own critique, saying that well, the claim is that the result of everyone doing what he really ought to do cannot be worse than the result of everyone doing less than what he ought to do. Although the result of everyone doing what he reasonably believes he ought to, could be. So, simplistically, simply put that well, if we all do, go by our moral conviction and do much more, then uh, it will bring about uh, in the utilitarian calculus, a lot of uh, suffering or deficiency at the donor end. And uh, that would be unnecessary, because you will find the resource, resources required at the end of the catastrophe or calamity, far less than what is being generated. So, what do you guys think of this? This is when, when this critique happens, that well, if I, if everybody starts doing or living up to their moral duty, then it turns out that uh, uh, more resources are generated, and uh, it is almost like, and uh, at the cost of the donors. It is almost like a uh, he is trying to bring about, a, however trivial it sounds, a, almost a logical problem with uh, having, a, or if everybody succumbs to the call for passionate donation that Singer is talking about. He himself provides a response. Yes. Hmm. When he says that it is not that everyone acts simultaneously. Yes. Sir. And so, different people donate at different point, hmm. and uh, as time goes on, um, the amount the calculations will show that the amount that is required is changing. And so, at any point when a person is donating, they would, they would attend to what is required mm -hmm. and respond accordingly. Mm -hmm. So, in, in reality, it does not work out like that, that everyone donates a fixed amount. Excels, yes, yes. And that, uh, if everyone donates very uh, 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 fanatically and to the most of their possibility, and the accumulation of excessive resources. So, it is almost like, when you call for a group of volunteers, or call for a donation, you really know that, uh, intuitively know that, uh, perhaps uh, your collection will not be as much as you expect, or uh, the call will not, or will rarely uh, materialize into a 100 percent uh, call for volunteers, or contribution. That it will always be less than what is uh, expected. So, if everyone goes overboard, the logical problem is that well, we accumulate uh, much more, and uh, which is a unnecessary. But yes, if everyone does what, what they really ought to, hmm. to do. Yes, yes. But it's it's a problem that can have practical solutions. The the um, receiving agency can stop receiving if it has received the amount, all the amount that's needed. Mm -hmm. It can say stop donating. Yes, that we have had enough, and we require no more. Okay. I would also think that it is a kind of a in principle trivial logical objection uh, raised, that well, uh, we, uh, that everybody going or overboard. Now, good that you made the correction between overboard and doing one's duty, because that brings us to what we are uh, going to talk next. Is this particular difference between, yeah. So, when you are talking about the second point, hmm. this line that, uh, why I should give more than anyone else in my situation. Hmm. I think uh, he is, uh, you are talking about the very psychological standpoint. Mm -hmm. It happens like uh, as a human being, they are thinking that why I should give more than others. Mm -hmm. it, hap like it is our psychological attitude. And uh, if you apply the third uh, point that if everyone in my situation makes a contribution of some currency mm -hmm. and the crisis is solved, so I should contribute some currency. So, here he is talking about the majority. Mm -hmm. He is not saying that everyone that means past, present, future. He is talking about the majority, and if the majority will give something, then automatically it he is create a balance uh, between the society uh, poor uh, group as well as the rich group. And he is saying that if, if maybe it is a small currency, a small amount, still it creates a huge amount in the last moment, then we can contribute this amount to the uh, that society which, uh, which are uh, facing the family problem. 
so i think he is trying to collaborate or he is trying to uh, enjoyant uh, um, relationship between the four as well as uh, this group and uh, here he is not indicating that why i should it is the psychological statement and the third one i think he is trying that uh, uh, even if a small amount then you have to care that doesn't mean that a small amount uh, it will not create something else but it can also help to eradicate suffering from our society when you're talking about like there is a river and like small drop of water is most important to create a huge Yes, perhaps let me uh, uh, put an analogy for the question that he is putting forth. Suppose we are a class of three okay. and one of us uh, falls sick and we are all far away from home and we require medical attendance. Now, there are 24 hours in a day and if one of us falls sick, we, uh, there are two people who can render their service and or assistance and so each one uh, ought to uh, or each one does 12 hours. So, Singer's claim is that well, if there are two people who are going to help the pa uh, or assist the patient and there are 24 hours in a day. So, I should do my 12 hours and with that 12 hours I should walk away. So, uh, this question that if everyone in my situation makes a contribution of uh, a fixed unit. So, uh, then uh, the crisis is solved. So, in principle if each one uh, of the two people who are well uh, stand assistance for 12 hours each, then a day is covered. So, assuming that that is an assumption. So, when he co points out in the fourth bullet that well, the premise is in the form of an hypothesis. So, what is the premise here that well, uh, if uh, two of uh, uh, if two attendants uh, give 12 hours each a day of attendance is done. S therefore, what is the factual uh, conclusion? Therefore, I should give 12 hours of or stand 12 hours of assistance, but would that be the case? Now, that assumes that everyone else will donate that much. So, Singer's call is that well, uh, this is not a justifiable uh, uh, claim, because it starts as an hypothesis that well, uh, surely if uh, the second person does not turn up, the first attendant perhaps would not walk away trying to think that well, if both do 24 hours, uh, both do 12 hours each, 24 hours is covered, a day is covered. So, let me do my 12 hours and then that is the obligation of the other, but uh, Singer's claim is that well what if we, uh, uh, why should we excel or exceed in what is uh, an average expectation from us. So, the fallacy here is that well, we are assuming that everybody will contribute, Maybe the other uh, person will not turn up. So, would you abandon the patient and go back home? Maybe he is talking about the concept of duty in one sense, like as a human being, we have some relation to other human beings. So, we have to do our duty properly. So, yes, his, his call is that the duty is uh, should not be measured in terms of the other agents. That well, I will do as much as I can do. So, he is making a very fundamental claim that he is uh, isolating the individual, that th there is a, a crisis and I am an agent how others react to it should not influence my decision. So, it is almost a, a very uh, neo western uh, basis of uh, human functioning that well, I am an individual and how others react to a situation that does not affect me, should not in turn affect me. So, if there is, I, if I am to do what I need to do uh, or what is the most I can do, then let me do that irrespective of what others do or what others are expected to do or what others can do. Then again it will be problematic for him also, because hmm. he is coming out with the utilitarian regime. For utility, sometimes we have to sacrifice our own uh, like uh, goodness, our own happiness. Comfort. That is exactly what he is saying. The why not sacrifice as much as possible? Because when I, when the question is that if everyone in my situation makes this much contribution, so everyone satisfy, uh, sacrifices a little bit of happiness to uh, take care of the problem there. Uh, so, that is the one way of working that well, if there is a famine in uh, Bangladesh, so I should, if uh, India has uh, 100 crore citizens, so each uh, citizen gives uh, 1 rupee and therefore, Bangladesh gets 100 crores, which is uh, assumed enough to satisfy the uh, situation in Bangladesh. So, I should contribute 1 rupee. Yeah, so, it is, uh, he's, uh, maybe he is talking about the duty prospective hmm. that uh, I have to give only 1 rupee, hmm. but when he is talking about like uh, donation or the charity, I think it is like uh, one's private uh, uh, 
Well, he does not regard it as a private interest. In fact, if we when we talk about uh, duty and charity, he is asking that you must give as much as you can give. As much as possible. But uh, why it will be father's day? If you will apply the index, uh, deductive method, that mm. is, if everyone is doing something, then I will, it is like fixed for me, then I will be continuing. Because like both. You see, because both the claims, the premise and the conclusion do not belong to the same category of uh, statements. So, when whereas, the premise is in hypothesis and the conclusion is a factual claim. So, when we suffer with if and then. So, when, when the premises itself is an hypothesis, it is in uh, the truth claim of the premise is not there, because an hypothesis is neither true or nor false. So, basing on that, how can one make a conclusion as true or false? So, where the premise analogy, mm -hmm. uh, if the premise is, if it rains, the floor will be wet. Now, if the antecedent is not satisfied, if it does not rain, can we say independently of it, that the floor will be rain, uh, the ground will be wet. We cannot say that. The ground will be wet only if the antecedent condition is satisfied, if it rains. So, only if everyone involved in that situation makes that contribution, yeah, it is like I will be satisfied. Yeah, yeah. It is trying to do that. So, a stronger rebuttal is that, well, the premises does not have a truth value. The premises has to have a truth value to connect to the conclusion. Sir, I ask one question. Hmm. Uh, when he is talking about the utility, uh, he is uh, talking about what type of utility. Is there any like, specific utility he is talking about? Because there are different types of utility. So, in which group, uh, group of utility he is talking about in this article? Well, he is. Uh, um, uh, uh, bringing about alleviation of suffering. So, the standard utilitarian is to bring about uh, happiness of the majority, which is also understood as uh, alleviation suffering for the maximum people. So, utility is what resources, say he talks about uh, downright money, that what uh, 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 happiness money can get you as an extra, as a citizen of a, or, or as, as a comparatively prosperous and wealthier citizen. Why not spare that much of utility and pour it into the uh, alleviation of suffering? Uh, elsewhere. Yeah, I agree with you, but hmm. my question is that, of which theory he is applying here, because there are many branches or many sub theory of utilitarianism also there. Mm -hmm. So, which utility theory he is applying exactly? What kind of utility theories are you talking about? Uh, like uh, classical utility or uh, Mills or Bentham or modern utility or um, marginal utility, which utility exactly he is talking about? Okay, what you would perhaps like to uh, look at it this way, that he is expressing his views, which can be classified into a theory. It is perhaps not that there is an abstract theory, and he is trying to fit in the uh, in, uh, raw input data, or the empirical data that he is receiving, and uh, uh, putting it onto the situation, and trying to get a solution. Right. So, it is not that he wants to be a utilitarian philosopher of this particular uh, model, and thereof he is finding this kind of a solution. It is rather the other way around, that he is trying to find this solution. It is the eternal uh, relation between theory and practice. So, when I say that I am a Kantian, what do I mean? That for every problem that uh, I uh, Kantian rules, or is it that the way I think is similar to uh, the way Kant has put forth his theories. So, different, two things are, two statements are totally different. Hmm. Because when the, you are talking about the first one, hmm. it is basically depends upon the Kant's exact what hmm. is he mentioned. Hmm. And when you are saying that I am following, that means there is something Kantian principles with your principles. Mm -hmm. So there is a difference. And I think maybe he is talking about the qual quantitative uh, utilitarianism mm -hmm. because he giving emphasis on quality rather than I think. How is he emphasizing quality? He is quantity, also. Hmm. Quantity. Ah, how is he emphasizing quantity? quantity of the like uh, um, people, the majority of the people. That major, uh, like huge amount of money is needed hmm. for uh, the suffering. I hmm. think it's basically emphasis on quantity rather than quality. But again, uh, what the problem between quantitative and qualitative utilitarians was faced, was uh, perhaps resolved in favor of uh, that human happiness cannot have numbers attached to it. No, when right. he is talking about that hmm. there is a difference also. Again, hmm. he creates a difference between uh, 
qualitative and quantitative. Mm -hmm. Both is necessary. Mm -hmm. And uh, for qualitative, like uh, reading a book, mm -hmm. is qualitative. Mm -hmm. And uh, like uh, alleviation of suffering. Sorry, he is uh, trying to create that there is a higher uh, hierarchy. Mm. hierarchy in that sense there is a higher uh, happiness and the lower happiness. Mm. And uh, in higher happiness, he is talking about that uh, um, reading or meditation like that, and mm. the lower that uh, watching movie and other things, mm. so, which is the best can based on the senses mm. that is in our uh, six sense organs that is the mind. So I think uh, he is basically emphasis on the lower category of the. Uh, who? Uh, singers? Yes, because basically hmm. uh, he is not talking about uh, the uh, higher quality of happiness. Right, okay. Uh, in fact, towards the end of it, yes, he makes a point that well, alleviation of suffering or basic animal existence is uh, definitely uh, a part of the utility. So, uh, singer would not be saying that well, the, the pleasure I get say, uh, if you want to spare a certain amount of your resources, I would have bought a book and read it and had that higher order pleasure from that. Instead of that, let me uh, put it into uh, uh, famine relief and therefore, I derive, I, I deprive myself of that pleasure of uh, higher order pleasure as to say, compared to the basal pressure, uh, uh, requirements of survival that happen for famine relief. But here, I think the distinction made is very clear that when he, when he talks about, when we will talk about what he requires, uh, calls as marginal utility and he particularly targets the consumeristic uh, environment prevailing in his times and continuing till now, in fact, spreading quite a bit that well, if one is agrees uh, to spend more on say clothes or uh, luxury that are not necessary, instead of spending that resources on famine relief, then one is doing something which is wrong. And that is a very clear calculus that he is mentioning, because it is the, the uh, use of a uh, utilitarian calculus is when it is uh, in the same domain of say comfort of between two individuals, say your book versus my book. So, why should you spare your resources for me to buy a book or the other way round. But here it is a very clear uh, uh, indication that whereas your uh, uh, the luxury in a consumeristic uh, uh, society of a developed country versus ba basic survival in an underdeveloped world. So, he does not even enter that well uh, is that uh, is there a debate in weighing these two, he finds that as uh, clearly resolved. Yes. Do not these two different matters mm -hmm. fall into two different lists of uh, utilitarian consideration. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, we have a list of things uh, that bring about, that positively create happiness. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, we have a list of things that um, remove suffering. Mm -hmm. So, buying a book or buying anything any uh, consumerist object for oneself belongs, falls under the first list, mm. whereas acting to reduce the suffering due to famine falls under the other list. All so other list. How do you compare items? Yes, there is no requirement for a compare, because the division is clear. Where, if it were uh, uh, in the same domain, say your comfort versus my luxury or one agent's comfort versus another agent's comfort is there, where we require to perhaps have a quantitative, uh, which is quite uh, outmoded, but except in the market based economic way of understanding the world order, where we would try to, because it becomes when we associate numbers with uh, satisfaction, it becomes very easy to compare the satisfaction index achieved. So, but in this case, I think we do not even have to enter that venture, because they are at two diametrically opposite poles. One is basic survival and the other is uh, an optimal lifestyle or an enhanced lifestyle. We can apply also the cost um, benefit analysis in this case, mm -hmm. like how much uh, benefit and how much. But, well, he has nowhere uh, implied a numerical equivalent of uh, that, uh, how much would you rate say uh, suffering as minus 7 and uh, consumeristic yeah, lifestyle as plus 3. Yes, but that will bring about the alleviation of suffering. Okay. Is he like giving the emphasis on minority, because generally when you are talking about the utilitarian thing hmm. and we are uh, generally like uh, against like, it, we are not ignore the uh, minority. Uh -huh. No, in fact, uh, utilitarianism has always been uh, critiqued as ignoring the minority. Here, I think he is giving emphasis on minority. That means, minority here means that family uh, uh, 
Uh, well, no, not as much, not, not minority, it is perhaps more on who is uh, uh, the well resourced from the ill resourced. So, the people who are comfortably uh, affluent and people who are at the brink of survival. Yes, you had something to add? I do not think uh, alleviation of suffering is hmm. a lower order thing. Hmm. Um, so, in the second list, where we consider um, things that have to do with removal of suffering, um, the more primal and fundamental the suffering is, the higher up it would be on that list. So, um, corresponding to higher order pleasures in this first list, uh, you would have higher order Alleviation. Well, lower and higher order would not that uh, way, uh, be as much as in uh, hierarchy as in necessity. So, when uh, that we need food, shelter and uh, these things as uh, essentials. So, when they say lower order is basic minimum. Huh, but it, hmm. would, it would hold. It would hold definitely much more value over what he calls higher order, because after your lower order uh, requirements are fulfilled then the question of higher order uh, happiness uh, comes around. So, after you are well fed, healthy and uh, have a comfortable place to stay, then comes your search for a uh, higher order of uh, happiness. Uh, yeah, uh, he is talking about that uh, net balance hmm. between uh, two things. Yes, net balance between, okay. For him, this was, this would not be uh, an issue at all perhaps. My understanding of Singer is that he makes it very clear that it is only that in fact, he stops his uh, argument by his, uh, saying that anybody who disagrees with me need not read further. That is a very uh, unambiguous claim that if you try to quantify uh, suffering due to famine and death and disease versus a lifestyle, uh, an enhanced lifestyle, then I am not talking to you. So, he takes that is almost axiomatic. But let us come back here. Now, he talks about this notion of duty and charity. This is what one, uh, I would see a deeper almost a meta ethical claim that uh, Singer does that we will talk about later also. He is trying to revise the current moral standards. So, what does he do? He first questions it, what the, that we have a traditional moral categorization. And uh, what is this categorization? He uh, targets the distinction between duty and charity. We have certain things as uh, understood as duty and certain as charity, but he finds this distinction as untenable. The charitable person is praised, but the one who is not, is not condemned. Conspicuous consumption along, alongside penury does not raise eyebrows. In fact, here I would uh, like you to reflect on the Indian exp experience with inequality. That uh, when we make huge donations, or when, when, and when any uh, person makes a donation, he is appreciated or he is praised. But when somebody does not, who is capable of making a do, uh, donation, does not make a donation, that does not uh, raise eyebrows. So, that is what is uh, uh, perturbing Singer. That, uh, and particularly, if you look at it uh, uh, in the Indian experience, uh, post liberalization, we have had a phenomenal level of affluence coming into the country, which exists alongside with perhaps uh, uh, poverty levels of sub-Saharan Africa, with affluent levels of uh, the Forbes 500 uh, in the world. So, this, uh, if Singer uh, looks at this uh, situation in the Indian milieu today, he would be angry at uh, people that something is wrong with your moral standards, because in a land of poverty, you cannot uh, in su such a uh, penury alongside with such affluence says that there is something wrong with our uh, moral categorization. That well, conspicuous consumption uh, alongside with penury does not raise eyebrows. So, it does not. So, it is still considered that well, if uh, a very wealthy man makes uh, 10 percent of his uh, assets into charity as a very renowned or a great uh, thing to happen. But whereas, uh, the f uh, what Singer would say is that, because he does not make 50 percent or 70 percent, how much he can spare comfortably, that should raise eyebrows. So, it should actually be uh, condemned that he is making such a small uh, contribution. Do you think that he is indicating only the Indian experience with the inequality? No, 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 that is my reading of it. That is nowhere what. Uh, why do uh, you think that, is, uh, like, uh, what do you think that, why it is it brings about, because what uh, Singer at that time, now remember this is 1971 and the world is not so well connected as it is today. Uh, but even then, Singer has a problem that uh, people uh, uh, in developed countries are spending uh, huge amount of resources for the development of a supersonic jet versus not funding a famine affected country. But in the Indian milieu today, this 
contrast is even more clear, because right in the same city, same town, if you would find a plush affluent colony, surrounded by a, a group of shanties. So, that is what, uh, this is, uh, even if Singer may, uh, although he does not uh, excuse, but he may say that, well, we have uh, distance, that uh, proximity uh, is making a psychological influence. In the Indian experience, their uh, proximity is not a uh, excuse at all, because right outside uh, a plush living colony, you will find uh, a bunch of shanties. So, in fact. May say that the uh, ambit of pro proximity has shrunk even further. And physically. So, for the western world, it is still available as uh, through electronic means of communication, but in the Indian milieu, it is right out there you have to just step out and see. So, seeing that, he uh, is saying that, well, anybody who is not donating significantly, needs to be seen as a immoral person, not just as a uh, moral person, who does not choose to do charity. So, that is the kind of, so this whole notion of uh, supererogatory acts, that well, supererogatory acts are the acts that, uh, very good if you do it, but nothing wrong if you do not do it. Now, what do you think of these kinds of acts, that well, uh, say, uh, if somebody donates significantly, then that is a very good thing, that the person is doing. But if somebody does not, it is not condemnable. A singer's claim is to bring back, that well, somebody who is not, is to be seen as doing something wrong. So, uh, this is what he is doing, he is, uh, this is. In third context, you are talking about the duty here. Pardon me? In third context, uh, you are talking about the concept of duty. Okay. Uh, in the current moral scenario. So, uh, uh, when we say, what is the moral categorization, what is uh, conventional. So, what is, say, uh, I will give you an example, a contextual example, which will, he is questioning the context. 30 years back, in, in a classroom, uh, students were expected to stand up, when the teacher entered. Uh, you say, say, in an Indian classroom. That was a moral uh, tenet, at that time. The moral tenet today, is that it is not required, that. When I talked about the Indian classroom, right. So, the, every society has its uh, moral dictates, which is at a time. Now, think of some moral dictates, which were earlier there, or not here, uh, and uh, uh, prayers. or prayers also, or um, think of various uh, courtesies and acts. So, uh, addressing the teachers as uh, the madam. Right. Or even say, uh, asking, uh, yes, asking for a glass of water to a uh, stranger in a, an unknown household, or unknown uh, place. So, now, you would be expected that, well, you better go to the nearest shop, and buy your water. So, that is, uh, in fact, uh, if I may just have interrupt a small, uh, there is, yes, anecdote, a voluntary association in uh, Haridwar, who once told me about this uh, situation, the uh, questioning civilization, that, whom do you call a civilized person. Now, uh, when you find, uh, imagine you as a city dweller, who has gone up to the mountains, lost in the mountain, and then you uh, reach one place uh, in a village, and you ask them, uh, for a little food to eat, you have lost your way. What will, in probability, what they would do? They would do is, uh, not only feed you, perhaps provide you a bed to sleep, and the next day, they will try to put you on a bus back home. Now, imagine this same person has come to your city, and he's got lost, and he's uh, rung your bell. If your security guard does not turn him away, you would, telling that, well, it is, uh, yeah, how dare you uh, bother me about this thing. So, this is questioning the this, this is, this is, yes, this, this is questioning that, whom would you call a civilized person. Now, the one, uh, um, uh, who was up there in the hills, helping you, or one who is right here. Now, uh, so coming back, that is what, in, in uh, moral standards, change over time. And uh, Singer's powerful claim is that, what is being regarded today, is as charity, is really ought to be duty. So, if there is somebody, who has fallen down on the road, and if uh, somebody goes to an onlooker, or a passerby goes to help that person, then it is seen that the person is benevolent, is charitable. But Singer's claim is that, well, that person is doing just what his duty is. In fact, the person who is not, the passerby who is not assisting the one who has uh, fallen on the road, is actually doing something condemnable. So, is violating a duty. So, uh, this notion of supererogatory acts, that have uh, come up, that acts, which if you do is good, but if you do not do is not, uh, uh, is, is ok. Uh, Let us think of some examples of it. Now, if you, we are, because we are in a uh, moral climate, 
only the climate keeps on changing. So, now perceive as something which are regarded as super erogatory apart from of course, uh, uh, significant charities or uh, financial donation. Right. Okay. There you could uh, bring in the question of the reliability of the information. I would think of another example say blood donation. India has a very high number of young people eligible to donate blood and yet uh, India has a, a shortage of uh, blood supply. So, this is a clear cut case where somebody donates a blood, he is made to feel uh, special and he is made to, he is given maybe a certificate from Red Cross or whatever, whoever has organized the blood donation. What Singer's claim is, those persons need not be given certificates, they have done what their duty is. Those who are uh, fit enough to donate blood and are not donating blood, they should be looked down upon on the moral scale. So, donating blood is not a charity, it is a duty. So, especially when there is requirement. So, uh, uh, likewise, it is not a super erogatory act to donate blood. Uh, if you would like to bring up any other example that strikes you as yeah. which is being relied. Providing medical help to some injured animal mm -hmm. on the street. Yes. Something that most of us overlook. Yes. If they need help. If they need help. Mm -hmm. If they choose, uh, if they wish to. Uh, we uh, seek assistance for say, uh, going past the road or anywhere. Okay. Well, what uh, Singer is doing in true philosophy spirit, is holding a mirror to the world out there. That well, look at this, these are your current standards and you would like to revise them. So, like art and literature and philosophy does, is a part of humanities, they are trying to reflect or hold a mirror to the world, to the society out there and show them their own standards and uh, perhaps influence a change. Uh, what will happen. Now, Singer clearly has a direction. He wants uh, debunking these notion of supererogatory acts, but again uh, he tries to analyze that why did this notion of supererogatory acts come up. So, uh, when he is claiming that well a call to redraw the distinction between duty and charity, the current demarcation is not correct and needs to be revised. Well, he is trying to first uh, understand why this happens, which is perhaps in the next slide, but now he talks about the implications of redrawing this distinction. So, uh, Yes, this is in a way also the justification why this uh, uh, distinction has been made. So, this distinction uh, keeps the domain of duty limited, but rigid. Expanding it would supposedly make all the tenets weaker. The entrance or the entrance in the moral tenets from charity into duty would weaken the existing tenets in the duty domain. So, what is he saying? He is basically saying that well, if you increase, you now we have a certain uh, domain of duty. So, we have a domain of a duty that when we, uh, in the current moral climate, when we have disagreement to with someone, we do not use physical force. We try to go to a third party resolution. Now, if uh, we enhance this domain of duty into getting say, uh, uh, donating as much as you can, that every person has to donate a, a bottle of blood every uh, three months. Then, this domain of charity becomes so large, that people would stop even uh, doing the fundamental duty of confirming to the expectation of the notion of duty, that one should not use physical force, when in disagreement with the other. So, uh, that is one reason, that he says that well, enhancing the notion of duty, will weaken what is already there. What is already is there, that we suppose, we do not want to use physical force. Uh, what is not there, is we should denote as much as we can. So, we move this second tenet, that we must donate as much as we can, into the notion of duty, that weakens what is already there in the notion of duty. Because that duty is almost like a mental uh, binding, that this ought to be done. So, whether or not this moral thinking is a moral binary, that it is either and or. So, uh, it is like that, well, follow one rule in the book, I as well as not follow any rule in the book. So, uh, the second thing, uh, second uh, uh, almost like an uh, extrapolation that Singer tries to find out, that well moral tenets, uh, tenets are shaped by the local societal needs, from the localized context. Extraneous participation does not enhance localized needs, and may instead be a drain on local stability. Okay. Simply put, distinction between, uh, we are talking about charity and duty. Why is this distinction there? He perhaps, 
I think of two explanations for it. The second one is saying that well, all our moral sense of duty has evolved. There is a very dominant theory that our moral domain has evolved out of our local societal needs. So, if in a society, uh, for example, uh, water is a scarce uh, resource. So, water is deified, so that uh, its wastage is seen almost as uh, not just a wastage of resources, but is seen as immoral. So, using that kind of an analogy, Singer tries to put in that well, moral uh, tenets are built by local societies. And local societies do not require you to design these tenets for their own survival. They do not expect that uh, it would help the society neighboring yours. Uh, so, therefore, it has been acts which render assistance to neighboring societies have been rendered as charity rather than duty. Whereas, uh, acts which are essential for the survival of one's own society are in the relegated to the domain of duty. So, uh, these are basically the implications and the explanations. So, uh, as he rightly makes this terminological correction, that these may be the explanation, uh, these may be the, uh, there is a mistake there, these may be the explanations of the built uh, difference between duty and charity, but does this provide a justification. Yeah, when you are talking about the charity, hmm. so we can say like, uh, if someone is donating, hmm. Right. What is the motivation of, uh, in fact, uh, no, Singer has nowhere gone into the motivation. He has just worked on that this ought to be the motivation or the policy for uh, donation. So, he is nowhere exploring in this article that, uh, what are, can there be contributions or donations, which are of may be a more vested interest or maybe uh, maligned uh, intentions or malified intentions. So, but when hmm. you are talking about that, uh, it uh, is up to the uh, individuals. Hmm. No, he is not saying that. He is challenging it. He is actually, yes, he is challenging that. That he is saying that, well, if uh, we all ought to do as much as we can. So, he it is like, uh, like a good philosopher, he is engaging, he is inventing his own critique and answering these uh, doubts. So, when he says that, well, uh, some people try to make a claim that, well, why not uh, donate my average of the donation. So, his reply to this, so he is floating his own critique and then attacking his uh, critique. So, it is almost uh, follows the Platonic uh, dialectic tradition, that where it happened in the form of a play, here it happens in prose. That well, uh, what was the opponent say? That the opponent would say that well, duty and charity are different things, but he is uh, saying that well, uh, this needs to be revised. It is just explanation, how this division occurred. So, but this does not give a justification. So, he answers this, that this duty and charity distinction has to be reconfigured. And this reconfiguration is because, and you can see perhaps smell out the strong Kantian perspective here, when he talks about that the moral point of view requires us to look beyond our society. Uh, now, this is my word I have used for Singer, is transperspectival. Uh, he nowhere uses it, but uh, that is the gist of his moral ethos, that well, you have to transcend your own perspective. And that is foundationally shared with uh, Kantian ethics, with deontological ethics or any impersonal ethics, which regards you, just as an individual amongst others in a collective. Uh, so, when you are using the concept of trans uh, perspective, are hmm. you talking about like something metaphysical, rather than the phenomenological? No, it is definitely no, not metaphysical in any sense used over here. It just uh, means… To look beyond our society, like… Hmm. Uh, not beyond uh, our society into an other world, but it is an epistemological claim that to look at different societies. So, uh, not from the uh, outlook that you have been used to. So, so we are using the different society, not I mean that you are talking about like other possible world. Uh, no, here here it is just the various societies in this very world. So, in fact, uh, uh, Singer here has very clearly steered away from any esoteric or metaphysical claims, especially when he starts. So, when he says, when uh, I uh, paraphrase him as transperspectival, uh, it is his impersonal claim that we are just a part of one society, and there are many societies here. So, when uh, Singer answers this uh, uh, distinction between duty and charity, 
the explanation that is traditionally come up. Uh, the first uh, point he puts forth is that, uh, the moral point of view requires us to look beyond our society, trans perspectival. So, the very, what is having one's perspective. So, having one's perspective is having one's take say, uh, you see uh, uh, as, as a stu uh, student or as a person, you have a perspective that well. Uh, uh, say, say uh, about any ritual, say that uh, one should not eat uh, non-vegetarian food. Now, the uh, another person has a perspective that uh, one should eat non-vegetarian food. So, there is a difference in uh, opinion. Why you are trying to understand from the other person's perspective? Why does the other person think the way one thinks? Apart from the fact, when there is uh, uh, dissent or disagreement is common to human existence. That wherever we are more than uh, one person, we disagree, especially when we are multiculturally embedded. So, why is that difference? This trans perspectival uh, or transcending one's perspective. So, I have my opinion on so many things, but when somebody has a different opinion, why does that somebody have a different opinion? That is when I am trying to transcend my perspective and trying to understand from the other person's perspective that well, why does that other person have different uh, views than what I have. Do you think that we can apply here this trans perspective uh, in this case, I think we can apply also the relative perspective in this case. Because when we are talking about the trans perspective, it will look different meaning like, like uh, it is coming something metaphysical as well as uh, talking very higher uh, level of uh, no, in, in fact, I think you can even argue, that people, philosophers have argued that, can we really transcend our perspective. We can have a relative idea, but I can never know how it feels to be you, and you can never know fe it feels to be me. That is one way of arguing that, transcending one's perspective is only finite. But yes, you are going to add something. But when you are indicating this concept, I think mm. you are just talking about one particular Please elaborate, why do you think? Uh -huh. uh, yeah, when you are talking about this, this concept, the, like this concept, hmm. I think you are just uh, focusing on one country, one society or one group, who is like, uh, based on intuitive knowledge or higher level of knowledge, maybe example of sand or vice versa or expo. But uh, in that moment, you are trying to create also a differences between one group Okay, uh, let me make this a little clearer that you can be a relativist holding uh, and yet being transperspectival. So it is not necessary that transperspectival means being an absolutist. So no, I'm not talking about the higher absolute. Hmm. That is the difference. No, it's not about higher absolute. It's just about a common truth. Let's let me give you an example. Say some societies find uh, polyandry uh, as a practice. Some societies find po polygamy as a practice. Now. Uh, and some societies have monogamy as a practice. Let us say, there are three societies. Now, to the relativist, there is uh, uh, no absolute claim, that uh, the relati relativist cannot claim, utter that well, uh, polyandry is wrong, or polygamy is wrong, or monogamy is right. The relativist cannot make any absolute claim, saying that well, your society, your own. When I say trans perspectival, it is not a, uh, uh, it is it's a methodology, it is not a uh, classification. So, trans perspectival is, say I belong to a monogamous society, I try to look into the history and the makeup of a polygamous society, and try to see why 
where uh, why did the society uh, approve polygamy? Was there a shortage of one gender and therefore, to continue the species that uh, the race they uh, sorted to polygamy or looking for justification that well, why did my society find monogamy right. So, I am nowhere still making a judgment that well, uh, one uh, that polygamy is wrong or monogamy is right. So, I can still be a relativist that each one has its own uh, uh, tenets, but why did the tenets evolve. So, I have uh, due to my lineage, my upbringing, my uh, uh, mode of interpretation is one. I am trying to under shift into another mode of interpretation of another culture to find out why did they have that practice. So, it is not perhaps a hierarchical classification that well uh, I can see why that a practice in the other society is wrong. So, it is nowhere that the uh, targeted western audience for which this article is written uh, is anywhere superior to the famine suffering Bangladeshis. It is just a claim that one ought to be trans perspectival. As a, uh, uh, the targeted uh, audience of this article are uh, affluent western uh, citizens, who are living in a society of comfort uh, bordering on luxury. So, from their perspective, it has to be, he uh, is asking them, calling them to transcend their perspective about life into what others perspective on life could be. It is a simple thing, why do you uh, this urge to help a uh, suffering being. Because the, the trans perspectival answer is that, because you see and perhaps you superimpose that kind of suffering onto yourself. It will perhaps become clearer once we uh, uh, run through the details of it. So, um, what Singer's claim is that well, what is, why should we be moral? We should be moral, because we are individuals as much as anybody else is. So, there that fundamental basic line or the lowest common factor, which is shared with Rawls and Kant and all impersonal ethics, that I am uh, uh, contrasted with a very personal ethics, that I feel I am special. So, I should use my resources to make my life more exciting. That is uh, contrasted a, a, a very personal ethics, that well I am the centre of my world. Impersonal ethics strips you of this specialness of being yourself. So, uh, uh, and you therefore, transcend perspectives and see that, not because it could happen to you. So, he is not appealing to the western audience that, tomorrow a famine could be struck uh, in uh, uh, this affluent part of the world, and therefore, uh, the Bangladeshis would help us. He is not even arguing for a quid pro quo uh, measure that way. He is just saying that well, you have to transcend your perspective and, and see that well, suffering is happening. You can uh, alleviate that suffering with a minimal affecting uh, effect on your lifestyle. So, so uh, he is an individualist in one sense, we can say. Yes, yes. In fact, the traditional conceptualization of an isolated decision making individual unaffected by others, as uh, happens in the western tradition, is clearly evidenced in uh, Singer's so, claim. Hmm. Because, when one is an individual, no, you are not exchanging, you are trying to understand the view of others, or the understand the plight of others. So, hmm. uh, his ethics are impersonal, but also individualistic. Yes, his, his claim is essentially, yes. Not self-centered. It is the individual centered. It is not a because if you contrast Oriental ethics or uh, anthropomorphic ethics, where uh, human beings are a part of greater cosmic order. In fact, that is very often critiqued as the classic differentiation between Eastern and Western ethics. That well, Western ethics is individual centric, whereas Eastern ethics is you see yourself as a part of order. The cosmic order is uh, uh, a singular, and you are just playing a part in it. So, that is definitely not what uh, Singer is talking about. Singer is talking about very limited singular individual decision. In fact, uh, uh, it may uh, help to mention that Rawls make, uh, makes two assumptions about his theory. Uh, the second one being that uh, individuals take de uh, decisions independent of others. So, what others uh, uh, make a choice does not affect what uh, one does. Now, in an ideal isolated individualistic society, yeah, the others uh, decision making or condition should not affect the one. So, uh, uh, so, the others happiness 
should not make you either happy or sad, and the other sadness should not make you happy or uh, sad. So, uh, that is what uh, the direction of a classic western society is, whereas uh, eastern societies are much more communitarian. So, they are linked up. So, when we have uh, uh, a milieu of uh, sorrow, it is supposed to cause sorrow in us. It is uh, uh, all decisions are for the uh, group, not for the individual. But okay, now going ahead, uh, he talks about yes, um, that why why this uh, for furthering this uh, uh, debate on duty and charity that uh, uh, Sidgwick and Urmson have argued that we need a basic moral code which is not too far beyond the capacities of the ordinary man, for otherwise there will be a general breakdown of compliance with the moral code. So, where should we draw uh, the line between conduct that is required and conduct that is good in although not required, so as to get the best possible result. Now, this is again I would say a read into this uh, Singer's philosophical acumen getting into drawing the distinction between the way things are and the way things ought to be. The classical distinction that uh, is talked about from Hume's time, uh, fact versus values. So, uh, the factual claim is that well, these moral standards have uh, this distinction between duty and charity has evolved uh, from empirical practices, but uh, uh, Singer's claim is that well, they ought to be revised and that ought revision or that justification has to come from us, it does not come from. Uh, cannot be understood from the social cult socio cultural background in which uh, uh, these practices have emerged. So, uh, uh, drawing a line between conduct that is good and though not required and conduct uh, that is essential, uh, so as to get the best possible result. In fact, uh, on a deeper level he leaves us with that question that if we redraw the lines that we have this uh, conduct uh, which is good or which is essential and that which is supererogatory. Essentially again going back to that question that supererogatory acts are uh, only uh, should be uh, brought down to the domain of uh, 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 necessary or necessary moral acts. So, uh, question raised which I see is how do prevalent moral standards affect the decision people take. Now, here again uh, I would see a crucial claim that uh, uh, Singer makes is that uh, the locus of change is within or without. Now, here uh, Singer very strongly points out that the locus of change is from without also. So, the uh, uh, moral milieu that we are raised and born and uh, function in affects us. So, today because uh, the moral milieu, uh, milieu around us claims that well, uh, blood donation is an supererogatory act, it is uh, an act for which you should be praised. So, we tend to have that same uh, feeling and that is why we do not have people lining up to uh, uh, donate blood. So, the change from all change is definitely not within. So, Singer's claim is to make a revision in the uh, moral climate that will make uh, a call to revise moral standards that uh, uh, well donating blood if anybody does donate blood or if uh, I can think of another example today perhaps. Uh, if I and my understanding of uh, the Indian scenario is accurate um, or fairly intuitive, say casting one's vote. Now, in, in colleges it is a hep thing today to show off that you have cast your vote, you show off your uh, the, the mark for voting. So, what is supposedly should be a duty has become almost an achievement. So, it is taken as default that uh, people do not vote and somebody who takes the pain to go and vote needs to get that recognition for doing something that voting has become a supererogatory act. So, yes he is uh, Singer does uh, uh, bring into light that well, how uh, uh, what should be in the domain of duty has become in the domain of uh, charity. So, at the whole on a, on a large scale uh, Singer is uh, making a call to revise moral standards that uh, uh, apart from the fact that uh, uh, making a phenomenal uh, uh, at the empirical level making a phenomenal do uh, donation to uh, uh, the famine struck people of Bangladesh, he is also making a call to revise moral standards. So, uh, he talks uh, he that uh, he counters this uh, argument that could uh, that uh, critiques make that well, 
uh, a massive increase in moral expectations unsettles and weakens the exist existent norms. So, if you are uh, if you enhance the rule book, then uh, people who are following that small uh, number of rules in the rule book will stop following uh, all the rules if you enhance the rule book. So, uh, pragmatism or wisdom has always uh, uh, of the people governing state of affairs has always held that well keep the rules thin and small, so that we can expect people to follow them. But if you enhance the rule book, it raises the expectations too high and, and high and whatever little rules that were being followed will also uh, no more be followed. So, uh, he also talks about this uh, standard critique of utilitarian paradigm, that there are too much of expectations, but it is only so in the times of need not always, because the standard critics criticism of uh, utilitarian uh, utilitarianism says that, uh, well uh, you are constantly sacrificing the individual for the collective. So, for the greatest happiness or the greatest alleviation of suffering, you are constantly making your life miserable. Well, making one's life miserable uh, is only when there are catastrophes or calamities, uh, calamities uh, across the world community or whichever community you hold as the frame of reference. So, he also talks about uh, um, a few details, that were uh, that are more interesting, if you are inter uh, I would like to explore the applied ethical part of it. Well, he uh, appeals to religious justification, because most of the religion have, uh, uh, he gives the example of Christianity, but perhaps uh, most of the religions have always uh, held uh, accumulated property as theft. And particularly in Semitic religions, that uh, uh, all property is theft, that it is, uh, when, when there is suffering elsewhere, it is immoral to uh, uh, live a life of comfort or uh, luxury. So, uh, in various forms it has been decodified, uh, it has been codified in various religions. So, Singer chooses the most uh, uh, accessible uh, of the Christian philosophers, Thomas Aquinas and talks about marginal utility, which is a very dominant uh, notion in uh, economic thinking especially market based economic thinking, that well, how much you can sacrifice to get what uh, to, uh, for uh, say uh, charitable causes or what according to Singer now is erstwhile known as charitable causes, what currently or rightly should be known as your duties. That what, uh, how much you must sacrifice from your comfort for your duties, it is something for us individuals to work out. Then he talks about preventing catastrophes. That, uh, uh, how do we, uh, that definitely uh, the whole world should not go on, on just famine relief uh, or from one calamity to another, but actively uh, donating or contributing in preventing such calamities happening. Because, uh, if you take a novice view of the world around, uh, it will seem strange, as, as, a, as a new entrant to the world, you will find that we have the technology to uh, make uh, medical care accessible, but we rather pref uh, prefer to spend it on uh, military spending. We have technology to, we have the power to uh, have a very uh, high basic standard of living, but we would still rather prefer a booming uh, economy and a uh, dwindling economy. So, we are not connecting these two. In fact, he also brings into light, because coming from a western uh, philosopher, it is not a very usual uh, uh, claim, because uh, this is contradicting market based uh, functioning, which most of the western societies follow that well, we need to create demand to spur supply and that chain brings upon uh, a lot of uh, uh, profit and driving the economy. So, yes, this in at, at another level, I would see that this brings forth the uh, perhaps in principle conflict between market based economics and the moral philosophy, which still is talked about when we talk about justice and the role of uh, governments. That, uh, uh, moral philosophy or ethics uh, seems to contradict economic logic. That market based economic logic or the market logic that is being presented, uh, is very often uh, counter uh, ethics. So, that there are, are there moral limits of the markets, as current philosopher Sandel puts it, that where are the current li limits of, uh, or moral limits of the market. Then finally, yes, that is a clarion call for the role of academic philosophers, that not to be uh, uh, contained in classrooms, but try to make an effort to reach out and uh, uh, bring down uh, philosophers from the 
uh, self contained ivory towers into making a difference in the world out there, at least attempting so. In fact, uh, Singer has himself lived a life of quite uh, uh, active uh, social and political involvement. Um, so, uh, this is what basically Singer is putting out a very, very passionate uh, uh, claim from a philosopher to the world out there. So, that is it, we can stop at that.